uh, we are live you can start sir good evening everyone <clears throat> and good morning to those who have joined us our colleagues from us uh just give me a second so uh, i would like to start this session by uh, paying tribute to this man professor rakesh tandon who was a doyen of gastroenterology and uh, uh, unfortunately we lost him this week on the 3rd of august uh, he was a former head of gastroenterology department at all india institute of medical sciences uh, a great doctor a great researcher a passionate teacher and researcher he was trained in india as well as usa and he was among the first luminaries who were responsible for starting and establishing the speciality of gastroenterology in india uh, his seminal contributions in the field of gastroenterology and pancreatology are internationally recognized he held some very important positions like the president and secretary general of indian society of gastroenterology the president of indian pancreas club he was awarded a number of awards like dr b c roy award the masters of world gastroenterology organization and also a recipient of lifetime achievement award by indian society of gastroenterology he was a teacher to a lot of gastroenterologists and hepatologists who are presently practicing in india including myself and we are all sorely going to uh, miss this uh fantastic teacher uh, and scientist uh with this i would once again uh, on behalf of inasal and all its members uh, pay tribute to uh, professor akesh tandon may his soul rest in peace thank you uh, thank you kaushal okay so, akash you can take over thank you kaushal uh, in uh, i welcome you all on behalf of uh, inasal to the inasal research methodology and statistics workshop this is the sixth session which is on sample size and meta analysis and uh, i am honored to welcome and uh, acknowledge the role of the course directors uh, professor paul thuluwat who is the director of institute of digestive health and liver diseases morsi Uh, medical center and professor of medicine university of maryland school of medicine he is also the chairman of the asld asia pacific uh, uh, regional advisory committee and he serves on the editorial board of hepatology liver transplantation and gi endoscopy they our own colleague and uh, uh, teacher to most of us uh, professor rakesh agrawal is the other course director Uh, he is the director of uh, jipmer uh, pondicherry and also currently the president of inasal uh, thank you both of you sir and uh, welcome to the to the sixth session at this stage i would also welcome both my uh, co moderators for the session today professor virendra singh he is the head of department of hepatology at uh, pgi chandigarh and uh, dr sanjeev segal he is the director of hepatology at the institute of uh, hepatology and liver transplantation at uh, medanta medicity gurgaon so i welcome my co moderators and i hand over dr viren singh for uh, the first uh, talk of the day Hi. The first talk is to be given by the Rakesh Agarwal, who is a director of Jipmer, and he is the best orator regarding the sample size calculation. And this is very very important in the planning of research. And without wasting time. i request dr rakesh agrawal to start the talk on the sample size calculation dr rakesh agrawal please uh, thank you professor virendra singh uh, and i will just share my slides
can you see my slides please yeah we can see sorry just give me a second That was fine for the last. Is that okay? It's okay. Yeah. So, the subject that I'm going to speak to you is sample size calculation. The first time that I dealt with the concept of sample size was not when I got into medicine. To me, the first time that I can think of thinking about sample size was when I was in class seven or eight. I had bought a new bicycle. My mother thought that when she went grocery shopping, she could take me along so that I could carry the groceries back on my cycle rather than her having to pull those and bring those home. And when I would go to a shop with her, that was a different era. I'm talking about early 1970s. We didn't have packaged rice and we would have rice something like this. And there are two sacks of rice. And her question, her decision would be, are the two sacks of rice similar? Is the rice in sack A similar to that in sack B? What did she do? So, sorry. What happened? Sorry, something happened. Just a minute, please give me a second. Uh, can you see my slides now? Hello. No, sir. We, we cannot see. No, sir. Okay, let me just share it again. So. It again, sir. Share some screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. So her question would be whether the two uh, types of rice are similar or not. Something has happened to my slide. Just give me a second, please. I think somehow my slides have got replaced. Kaushal, there is some confusion. Can we go on with the other two slides and uh, stocks and I can come back? Sure, sir. Sure. Okay, I'm sorry for this, some confusion. Uh, Something happened, some two slides have gone missing and that makes all the difference, sorry. Akash, Akash, are you there? No. Is Dr. Goodman there? Hello? I'm here. I'm here. Akash, you can. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, sorry for this uh, technical error. Uh, I would now would like to welcome uh, our second speaker for the day, and uh, that is Professor Good, uh, Professor Gilman. Uh, Goodman is uh, uh, he is a physician and a professor of epidemiology. He teaches courses on systematic reviews and meta analysis at Emory and at CDC, and uh, it's over to him now for his talk. Hello, good evening, everybody. Good morning for me and for Dr. Tulavas. I think he's also in the United States. Um, as uh, Dr. Akash said, I'm 
at the Emory University. I'm an epidemiologist, but I'm, my training is in, in uh, two disciplines, in pediatrics and preventive medicine. What I do most of the time is I do a regional research, collecting data, analyzing data, writing up. But a, a big part of what I do is also reviewing work by others and trying to synthesize evidence in a systematic fashion. So this is what I'm going to be uh, talking to you about today. Let me share my screen. And we can proceed. This is going to be a very brief overview um, because one can talk about this, this type of research for, for many, many hours. You know, I, I teach uh, at least two courses that go deeper into both philosophy and the techniques of how to perform systematic review. But what I will, my hope is to give you a flavor of uh, what this involves. Let us begin by uh, sort of looking at three very random conclusions from three different papers. And then I'll ask you a question. I know we are not in, the, in class, so this, it will be difficult for us to do a back and forth, but maybe we can together discuss the, the answer. There's no, no rhyme or reason to these particular three papers, but what I did, I just took the concluding sentences from each of them. And the first one, each, all three of them deal with uh, omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids as a possible um, agent that, that uh, against cardiovascular disease. And so paper number one says that there is little doubt that long chain omega-3 fatty acids are the, in fish are the key nutrients responsible for the benefits are important for CVD prevention. Okay, we got that. Second paper says about, on the basis of currently available evidence, the American Heart Association has recommended that all adult, adult eat fish, particularly fatty fish, at least twice a week, as well as vegetables containing plant-derived and three fatty acids. Okay, so that's the second conclusion. And the third, the third paper talks about fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids, and cardiovascular disease. Do they really work is the title. You can already foresee what the conclusion is going to be. And they, they discuss uh, that recently published trials in patients with CAD and other MI do not show an effect of omega-3 fatty acids on major cardiovascular endpoints. So three papers, three conclusions. And the question would be, what is your conclusion? What is your conclusion based on this scant collection of evidence? Do you think omega-3 fatty acids help against heart disease? Do you think omega-3 fatties don't work against heart disease? Do you think studies are conflicting? Or, do, or, or is your answer none of the above? And I, obviously, we don't have the opportunity here to collect your responses, although you can probably send them by chat if you want. Um, let's see, do we have any chat responses? We do. No, nothing so, so far. But a lot of people, rightfully so, would say the studies are conflicting. They would pick C. And if one or two in the audience will say that it's, the answer is none of the above, I would applaud that person because if we go back to the research questions and take another look at those three papers, we would realize that they actually talk about three different, two, at least two different things. The first two papers discuss prevention of cardiovascular disease, whereas the third paper talks about treatment for already existing cardiovascular disease or uh, a um, heart attack or MI. So we, what we really have here is not a collection of literature that addresses the same research questions, but rather a very heterogeneous group of conclusions that, that, you know, what we would call apples and oranges. They don't really address the same question. It's, there's a huge difference between taking omega-3 fatty acid in, for giving it to a healthy individual with the hopes of prevent disease down the road versus taking uh, somebody who just survived an, a heart attack and giving them omega-3 fatty acids in hopes to improve the outcome. And very often, people don't pay attention to this very crucial issue, and that is other, other papers addressing the same or different hypotheses. That's why 
it, you know, the answer is probably none of the above in, in this particular situation. You will see very often, you will look at uh, reviews of the literature where people summarize the evidence by simply restating the conclusions, but don't really take a deep dive into trying to analyze and synthesize what the evidence is. Mm. A little bit about, so that's why it's, doing a systematic review is actually a very difficult and laborious undertaking. Um, a little bit about terminology. We have three terms that often used. One is a narrative review, the other one is systematic review, the third one is a meta-analysis. The narrative review, all of us have done it. Anybody who has written a paper, whether in school or, or for a publication, have written an introduction section and a discussion section. And you would always cite other authors, you know, existing literature. That is a narrative review. The problem is with the narrative review is that it is um, not systematic. It's not, it's really not science. It's really more about a narrative, just like the name implies, as opposed to trying to analyzing, uh, analyzing the It's good for identifying data gaps. For example, when we apply for, for um, grants, we, we often present na the narrative review of the evidence that shows that, you know, the data missing for this, that aspect of, of research. It is very much susceptible to selective citation, which is a, a problem in, uh, in, in our business. And it's often regurgitation rather than analysis of the evidence. Um, systematic review is different. Systematic review is absolutely, there is no negotiation. If you want to address a specific research question, you want to provide evidence, for specific research questions and, and, and draw conclusions, it have to be systematic. I often tell my students that systematic review is really a study, research project. You recruit participants, like you recruit participants in a, in a, let's say an observational study or a clinical trial. You begin with inclusion exclusion criteria. Then you would recruit participants, you would collect information on these participants. Then you, then you would analyze the data, the information that you collect from those participants. The only difference in a systematic review from that of a, of a study with individuals is that your participants are papers. Your participants are published uh, studies as opposed to people. Other than that, you know, all the strengths and weaknesses and the pitfalls that are to a regular study would also apply to a study of uh, to a study of um, that is systematic review. And then finally, the the last term is uh, meta analysis. Meta analysis is is also a systematic review, but it has one additional element, and that is the studies that are combined to calculate summary measure of effect. And you know, this is the the, the most basic the uh, way of, of uh, presenting a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis can get very complicated. There is, there is a complex regression um, models that can be based. But at the, in a nutshell, a, a meta-analysis is a summary, is an attempt to calculate a summary estimate. So, as I mentioned earlier, systematic review is nothing more, nothing else but a research endeavor. It's a project that has steps, that follows a protocol, just like any other study. You begin with defining a research question, you develop inclusion criteria, you search the literature, you compile relevant studies, you would recruit participants into, into a, a individual research project, you develop coding forms sometimes, you code and tabulate studies, you critically review each studies, study, you conduct qualitative analysis of the evidence. Sometimes that's where you stop. You, you review the evidence, you um, present it in a systematic fashion, but maybe no additional steps are necessary. Sometimes you may want to assess the feasibility of a meta-analysis. And if the meta-analysis is feasible, you can perform it. You, there's always additional things that one needs to be considered before drawing conclusions. And finally, you arrive at your conclusion, assess the quality of evidence. 
This is routinely done by organizations such as Cochrane Collaboration, for example. It is now considered one of the cornerstones of, of drawing conclusions and writing recommendations or issuing gui guidelines in all areas of, of uh, health sciences, very much so in clinical. And so the, the word of caution, though, it's very important to remember the meta-analysis may not be a good idea, even if you can do it from the technical point of view. The data may not lend themselves to a meta -analysis. There's no harm in stopping short of doing a meta-analysis and just performing a systematic review. And there are plenty of examples of the literature out there where um, meta-analysis hurts rather than helps uh, in providing clarity. I'm going to give you a very simple example. It's a very recent example. It's in fact still unpublished. It's so far it's been on MedRx. I think it's going to come out fairly soon. But um, the reason I'm presenting is because it's, it's up to date and because this is an example of how we, one can work on projects now long distance. I have never met any of these people except, uh, um, except Miriam is the only person here among the authors that I've met because she's my former student. Everybody else is uh, somewhere else. They, um, some of them are in the UK. There's, I think one person was, was in India. Um, one person was in Nepal. And uh, Miriam was in the United States. And they reached out to me and said, we would like to do a systematic review of evidence as it, as it comes in, looking at clinical lab, lab parameters related to severe, versus um, moderate to mild COVID-19 illness. And so I said, sure, I can help you. And, and they proceeded with this. Um, I think it's probably going to appear in publication fairly soon. But I thought this is a the timely example. Step one, you begin with the research question. The question can be formulated as follows. What clinical laboratory parameters are associated with severe or critical novel uh, coronavirus disease 19, of course. Step two, you search the literature. There, there are all kinds of recommendations that are available for that. For example, um, uh, there are international guidelines called PRISMA. There are other international guidelines. Cochrane Collaboration has their own um, set of um, guidelines and handbook, um, handbooks. But you always begin with electronic search. You can the, the usual uh, rule of thumb that you do at least two electronic databases. For example, PubMed and Embase are the good ones. So PubMed is one in the United States, Embase is an international um, equivalent that includes more studies from Europe and, and other places. It's very important to use and report search strategies. In other words, the goal is, to, just like it is in a protocol for a clinical trial, is to make sure that people who um, trying to reproduce your results are able to have a, an exact blueprint of what needs to be done. It's, it's very helpful to supplement your um, electronic search with hand search of existing reviews, existing meta-analysis. Uh, sometimes people examine textbook chapters. Because there's a, always a danger that important studies that were, that were available but not published can be missed. It is not a bad strategy to try contacting authors, especially if you know people who work in the area, or, or if you find papers that, that came very close to reporting what you're interested in, but, but did not include it, you can always reach out. Whether or not you'll get a response these days is, uh, uh, it's not always, it used to, be, let's put it this way, 15, 20 years ago, it was almost always get a response. These days, not so much. The culture changes. There's a lot more people. There's a lot more electronic traffic, emails. People just don't respond to emails the way they, they used to. What's the what's next? Next is inclusion, exclusion criteria. Now, those have to be developed a priori before you, you have your, any of your analysis or results done. Because otherwise, otherwise, it becomes a post hoc thinking to focus on relevant studies, studies that, that exactly answer the same question. Otherwise, again, there is a danger of mixing apples and oranges, like we discussed in the beginning. You may limit studies of a particular design. For example, with uh, one of my students did an analysis on 
treatment for pre-diabetes. In other words, people who um, don't meet the criteria for diabetes mellitus, but they have already blood sugars that are, that are in the range of pre-diabetes, less than 146, but perhaps you know, in the 110 to 115 range. And so very soon we realized that we don't really need to even bother with the observational studies because there's plenty of clinical trials out there. And because clinical trials are probably going to be more, be considered more weighty in terms of trustworthy, in terms of results, we might as well just do analysis on the trial. You have to have your measure of effect, some kind of a measure of association. It can be a difference, for example, between uh, um, in hemoglobin A1C in people before and after intervention, or it can be a ratio of, of um, incidence of diabetes in, in people with intervention versus without. But, and then the most important thing, in addition to the measure of effect, you need to have some kind of a measure of precision. When I say measure of precision, this usually means a standard error, a standard deviation, or a confidence interval. Sometimes you, if you just have a p-value, you can also do a little bit of, of calculation to obtain those from, a, from available p-value. So once that is done, you present your data in a way that, can, that retraces all of your steps. This is typically done through what's called the prisma diagram. And uh, as you can see, this is the example of our, of our um, student project. So they started, as you can see, with 4,000 papers, roughly 3,800 papers. There were, there were additional papers found through manual searches. Um, it's about 50 or so. And then after all the reviews, screening, exclusion, all of that needs to be documented. Um, they arrived at the final um, sample size of 45 studies. And those are the ones that, that, that provided data for the meta-analysis. Next is time to summarize and classify this study. And I'm, I keep repeating it, but there's, there's, there's a strong parallels with a regular clinic, clinical trial or any other research project. Once you recruit the participants in the study, then you collect the data on these participants. And what you do, um, it's very important that you collect information that's important that's, that's relevant to your project, but also it's, one needs to keep in mind that sometimes several publications are based on the same data and you have to be very careful to consider that because otherwise you may have a very prolific group that publishes, you know, four or five papers every year on the same data and this, this the findings from that group will flood or overwhelm findings from other groups if they're considered as independent observations. So there are several ways of, of handling this. Most commonly in prospective studies, we'll just take the most, the most, up, um, the, 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 the longest follow-up so that the, the sample size increasing, or there are, there are a variety of other ways to do it. It is also very important to assess study quality. Some studies are, done very well and they clearly have to be given a little bit more weight than the studies that are that are less well done people do standardized scoring systems for example those exist Cochrane has one for um, clinical trials um, there, there are a variety of scoring options for observational studies they so called, called Newcastle Ottawa scale there are a few others this is just a screenshot of the, of the, the very first stable one from, from my student's project. And not surprisingly, the majority of studies available at the time they were doing this research, which was a couple months ago, were from China. Now, of course, that, and this is just, remember, there were 45 of them. I just didn't want to bother you with a long list. But this is one way to present the evidence. See, they give you the study. They, they report the study characteristics, they report what patient characteristics were included, and then they score the study quality. I think they use Newcastle Ottawa scale for that, and the, the study quality ranges from low to high. Now it's time to summarize the evidence and perform an analysis. It can be qualitative, as I said, especially if you don't have good data from individual study, or you can take one, it one step further and conduct. 
a very important part of meta-analysis is you combine the results in a single summary estimate. So you often see that in, in or it, but in addition, you need to test for heterogeneity. That is a, a formal way to assess agreement or disagreement across studies. So here is an example of the results for some of the, just, these are just uh, selected uh, measures, comparing people with severe versus, versus uh, mild COVID. And I, I only picked, they, is, this table is very, very long. It includes 50, 60 different, different parameters, maybe more. So these are the ones and in terms, expressed in terms of differences as well as ratios. But you can see that actually no surprise, almost any severe disease probably will present itself with, with uh, elevated thing, um, with, with um, things like thrombocytopenia, lymphocytopenia, if it's a viral infection, it's, um, you may have things like elevated LDH. Elevated dimer is an important, appears to be an important feature of a, of a severe COVID because of the, all the thrombotic complications and all that. One thing, word of caution, you see I square there on the right? This is the, one of the measures of, of heterogeneity. It's a very easy to interpret measure. If it's in the high 90s, that means the results are extremely heterogeneous. It means they are very, very much in disagreement with each other. If it's low, for example, zero here, that means the results are very much in agreement. Usually the rule of thumb that you want to stay under 40% if you want to pre present one summary measure. If, you, if, if, there, if your um, I square is up there, say 60, 70 or 80%, you may want to explore the reasons for their heterogeneity a little bit more. And sometimes you can just conclude that meta-analysis is just a wrong thing to do. Averaging results that are very, very uh, diverse doesn't do it any justice. And a very important issue is before drawing conclusions, we consider publication bias. This is what, you know, in regular research, we call selection bias, right? Means that you, you, your study, for whatever reason, included only certain types of participants versus other types of participants. Publication bias is a, is a critical issue in systematic review. It is a true phenomenon that's not, it's not just a theoretical, it's, it's, it exists and been proven empirically. For example, this is a classic study but out of UK, out of Oxford, where they looked at the, all the projects that were approved by their ethics committee, which in the United States we call the IRB, Institutional Review Board. And what they found is only half of them ended up being published. That means half of the studies were con conducted, completed probably, they, because they had a final re report to the ethics committee and, never, ne never, and nevertheless never saw the, the publication. And it's especially true of observational studies where the percentage is even higher of unpublished studies. But to do a publication bias, it's, a, it's really an, you know, there's all kinds of ways to deal with it. One is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, you can contact authors in search. The other one is con construct what's called funnel plots. I'll explain very briefly in a minute what that is. And then there are some fancy ways to do it, the so-called trim and fill technique, which are beyond the scope of today's conversation. But if you're interested, uh, you can probably send me an email. I'll respond to send you, send you uh, some background information how that is done. Perfect. How are we doing on time? Am I, am I um, behind or is it still okay? No, you, it's okay. I think I need another five minutes and I'll be done. Yeah. So the funnel plot, think about this this way. Large studies that are very pre give you very precise estimates. In other words, the ones that have very low standard error, low standard deviation, very tight confidence intervals. Well, because they are precise, they tend to be closer to each other. They will they will bunch together, so so to speak. As you can see in the here, the the way final plot is constructed, you 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 transfer. Transform your result if you have to into arithmetic scale. So zero means no, right? And then you, you put your standard error upside down so that the lowest standard error is the top of the graph and the highest standard error is the bottom of the graph. So that very precise study will be closer to the top and very imprecise study will be closer to the bottom. And what you would expect is the literature is 
reasonably well represented without without a lot of selection or or a lot of bias studies that are precise will bunch together we will be more or less in agreement with each other and then as precision drops you'll see that results start dispersing they kind of bounce around and ideally what you would want to see is a rough symmetry so studies to the left are more or less out uh, the same number as the studies to the right meaning that you that public the, the likelihood of publication is more or less equal regardless of what the studies found that's on the on the on the left what you see on the on the right the panel b is that half of the studies seem to be missing all the smaller studies are all in one direction and that is usually a warning sign that there may be publication by so in our case, um, I don't want to bother you with too many details of how, what these different shades, shades mean, but if you look at the literature for just one outcome, in this case, white, white blood cell count, you see that a lot of studies to the right and very few studies to the left. Meaning that in this case, we have to be cautious in interpreting the results because they seem to be that studies that showed association opposite direction that are missing. And finally, conclusion. So now that you've considered all of the evidence that's available to you, the possibility of publication bias, if you've done everything in a systematic way, you can start drawing conclusions that are data-driven as opposed to um, um, opinion-driven. So it's a very important to stick, to, to stick to the data. On the other hand, the public expects some kind of conclusion. So I think it's, it's also very important to provide those conclusions, even though sometimes your conclusions are, are limited to statement about data needs. So this is the conclusion that, that my students arrived at and, you know, take it or leave it based on their review. Um, so they compared to non-severe COVID, severe or critical COVID is characterized by increased markers of innate immune response, increased markers of adaptive immune response, and increased markers of tissue damage to major organ failure, which which is not necessarily a, a uh, earth-shattering conclusion, but it's probably true. And that's all I have. I'm ready to stop here, and, and uh, I don't know what, what your format is for in terms of asking questions, but um, I'll stop sharing the screen. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Goodman, for that excellent presentation. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have uh, question-answer sessions at the end of all the talks. And... Uh, uh, now we'll move on to the next lecture, uh, which is by Dr. Ashish Kumar. He is the professor of gastroenterology and hepatology at Ganganam Institute of Postgraduate Medication, Medical Education and Research. And Dr. Ashish is going to speak on meta-analysis, how to read forest plot. This is an extremely important uh, uh, discussion and I would uh, request Dr. Ashish to proceed with this presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Seigel, for your kind introduction. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, the INASL for giving me an opportunity to talk about meta-analysis, uh, how to read the forest plot. Dr. Goodman has already given a very good introduction, so th that has made my job easier. And here in the panel is Dr. Rakesh Agrawal, who actually had taught me meta-analysis, so I'm very thankful for him that I'm speaking before him. So. Uh, regarding forest plot. So as a, as a child, we must have uh, made lots of uh, forest uh, diagrams, forest pictures like these. But as a statistician, uh, when we talk about forest, it differs from these uh, small forests. And we actually, what we would do is rotate this into 90 degree and take the stems and add to uh, top of those uh, trees and remove all the background and make them dark and uh, not colorful and add something like a diamond below, add here, one line here, one line here, throw in some numbers and then we would call this a forest plot. So why should we make a forest plot? See, once uh, we are answering a question, research question and uh, most some studies are in favor of some intervention, other studies are against some intervention, so we don't know what to do. So the best option is to study a meta-analysis or read a meta-analysis or a systematic review. The most important uh, 
thing what we need to see in the meta analysis is a diagram which is called as forest plot because it summarizes the results from multiple studies into one figure and not only it does it give all the uh, some uh, statistics it also tells us how important each study is that means the weight of that study and then it finally gives a summary of uh, the evidence whether the intervention or uh, uh, our outcome is uh, the question what we are asking uh, do we get a clear cut answer or not so let us go into each component of a forest plot the first thing which uh, we make in a forest plot is a horizontal axis which sits in the below and that has got the effect size or the outcome effect the effect size depends on the statistics which we use if we are using a comparative statistics then the most likely most commonly used statistics is uh, odds ratio relative risk hazard ratio but there could be other kind of statistics uh, such as absolute ri risk reduction or standardized mean difference or proportion so any kind of uh, statistics we can use and we have to select those studies which has used similar kind of statistics so for example in intervention studies there can be two types of outcome one is dichotomous outcome and continuous outcome dichotomous outcome is, uh, is such that either positive or negative either alive dead pregnant non pregnant so when we are uh, doing uh, statistics for these then we'll use either odds ratio relative risk these are the most common there are other uh, things like hazard ratio we can use but when the outcomes are continuous for example how much has blood pressure reduced by a antihypertensive drug then uh, the outcome is continuous or uh, what is the redu reduction in the risk then uh, we will use something like mean difference or a standardized mean difference so uh, whatever we use we will put them at the bottom the second thing which we add in the metanal uh, forest plot is a vertical line which is called as the line of null effect and this line is placed either at 1 or at the 0 and it depends on the what statistics which you are using for example if you are using odds ratio relative risk we'll put this line at 1 but if you are using absolute uh, risk reduction or standardized mean difference then we'll put this line at 0 and sometimes we even skip this line for example if we are doing meta analysis on proportion so this line is a line of null effect and it is similar to the null hypothesis so null hypothesis says that our intervention is, will be no difference from the uh, control so that means intervention and the uh, without intervention and intervention both will be equal so though they will be same so the uh, null hypothesis will be uh, same and so the line of null effect will be on one but if you are saying uh, in terms of absolute risk reduction that this intervention will reduce the chances of mortality by 10 percent certain intervention will reduce the chances of mortality by uh, 20 percent so in control there is no reduction in mortality so that time the null hi uh, hypothesis uh, according to null hypothesis will place this line at zero so next once we have created this graph then we'll put in the data of individual studies the individual lines so these lines have got two components one is the result of that particular study the main study and the dispersion or the 95 percent con confidence interval the result is usually shown in the box and the 95 percent confidence interval is shown in the uh, form of a line horizontal line for example in this study the result was 0.45 and the 95 percent confidence interval range from 0.18 here this side up to 1.1 so this is how this study is placed now we also have to see what is below uh, the uh, horizontal line and it is often a good idea uh, where, uh, when we uh, label it uh, what the study uh, shows for example if most of the studies are on the left side and there's a comparison between treatment and control and most of the studies are on the this side and the summary estimate is on the this side then we can say that the our meta analysis favors treatment if it is on the other side it may say it favors control for example if there is a comparison between two treatment 
suppose we are comparing tenofovir with entecavir for hepatitis B, then both sides will be uh, the treatment arm, but one side will be tenofovir, other side will be entecavir. And whatever the, each of these studies lie, we'll say those studies uh, are favoring one of the two uh, um, outcomes. So the labeling helps to understand the result of individual studies of the meta-analysis and so most often the, you will find this labeling now let us put some more studies we have added three uh, two more studies so now we have three more three studies in this um, uh, forest plot so some studies have got a bigger box and some studies have got a smaller box so the size of box actually represents the weight of the study and usually the weight comes from the number of the patient or the sample size most of the time, but not always. So if the uh, sample size is bigger, we'll have a larger box. If the sample size is smaller, then we'll have a smaller box. So actually this gives the weight and that weight is uh, finally added up into the summary. Then the other thing is the confidence interval. So the long, um, so the confidence interval is uh, the simplest way to understand a 95% confidence interval is that suppose this experiment was, uh, was repeated a hundred times. Each time we'll get a result which is slightly different. But in 95% of the times, the result will lie between the lower bound and the upper bound. So uh, we are 95% uh, sure that the results will be between this and this. Uh, lower 5% and upper 95%. So this is 95% confidence interval. So uh, rule of thumb is that the narrower the con confidence interval, the more precise the study. And wider the confidence interval, we are more unsure of the result. So the actual results of this study is here, but it could have been here, it could have been here, it could have been anywhere. So uh, one another thing is if the line uh, of confidence interval crosses the line of null effect, then thus that study is uh, st statistically not significant for that treatment outcome. If it does not uh, cross, if it lies on the uh, one side or the other side, then uh, those studies are statistically significant. So now, once we have added all the study in the forest plot, what we uh, make here is a diamond. This diamond is the summary of all the studies and uh, which is calculated statistically so the, the diamond also has got same properties the width of the diamond is the confidence interval of the uh, summary statistic and where that diamond lies is the result of the summary statistics so uh, since uh, the diamond has with the diamond we are most confident in so most of the time the diamond's width will be smaller than the width of all the individual uh, confidence intervals of the studies. And the, this diamond represents the combined effect size and confidence interval when we have combined and averaged all the individual studies together. So um, uh, forest plot not just has got this graph, but it has got certain other uh, numbers and uh, labels, which I will come to here. The uh, leftmost uh, label is the individual study name of the author of that study and the year it was published so it is either given uh, year wise or it can be given uh, uh, alphabetically or depending on the effect size so each individual study and the lead author and the year of publication is given on the left side second thing is that uh, these numbers are there so there is one treatment group control group the n, smaller n mentioned here is the events in the treatment group and the larger n represents the total number of patients. For example, in this study by Gamsu, the total number of patients in the treatment group was 131 and total number of patients in the control group was 137. The events occurred in 15 patients in the treatment group and 22 patients in the control group. Similarly, on all these. So, uh, uh, most of the uh, forest plot ha will have this, which will give us a, uh, uh, an idea of how, how many the patients uh, were there in individual studies and what were the effects. Then the last column, most uh, commonly, is the actual risk ratios or actual odds ratios, which is actually the same thing which is represented here graphically 
is given here in the form of numbers. So this is the actual effect size and it is the confidence interval. And, uh, uh, and uh, finally, the lowermost row will show the total of uh, all the studies averaged together. So the diamond is here and the uh, effect size of that uh, combined averaged uh, effect as well as its 95% confidence interval. Finally, there's something in small prints on the left side, but it, this is also important. So the first thing we look here is the p-value here. P-value here is uh, the, uh, whether the uh, it overall effect was significant or not, which we can also do away with p-value. Since if the diamond is crossing the central line null effect, then usually the study is not significant. If it is not crossing, it is on either side, then it is significant. But same thing we can see also from the p-value. The other thing which is important we should look is on the heterogeneity and especially the I squared value, which has been already alluded to by Dr. Goodman. So I squared tells us whether or after combining these all these studies, whether the, these studies were heterogeneous or homogeneous, and lower the I-square value, uh, the better is the meta-analysis and more sure we are of the results. But at least it should be less than 50%. But if the I-square is more than 50%, then we have to do uh, certain additional things uh, to uh, get a better result. For example, we may have to do uh, this uh, combining the results using either rand random effects or fixed effects. So if there is high heterogeneity, you we use random effects. And also we need to explore why there is heterogeneity. So we may do a subgroup analysis. So we may group these studies into uh, various, by various parameters and we see why there is heterogeneity. And we also look at publication bias. So I'll give, share with you certain examples. This forest plot shows the standardized mean difference. Uh, uh, so here the uh, line of null effect lies in the zero. So most of the study had shown that the uh, uh, dif mean difference was in the negative side. And so the overall also was on the negative side. So here the main important thing is that this line of uh, null effect lies in zero. Here is a different kind of study where they were looking at incidence of death among various studies. And so the line of null effect is zero. But very important thing, since no study can have death in the negative, Either we can have zero death or we can have some deaths. So there will be no graph on the left side. So the graph starts from the zero and goes on the, this side. And the uh, line of null, null effect here will be zero. And so the overall uh, frequency of death uh, in this study was about 5% with this confidence interval. Another is the proportion. Uh, this is from the meta-analysis which I had done. So where I had looked at the uh, proportion of diabetes in patients who are admitted with severe uh, COVID disease and what I combined all the studies and what I found that the proportion was approximately 11% among these patients. So this is proportion and since we are dealing with proportion there's no line of null effect here. Then what sometimes if there's heterogeneity uh, and then we do subgroup analysis. Subgroup analysis, for example, in this meta-analysis, they have subgrouped the, instead of combining all the studies together, they have grouped them into male stud, uh, studies which have only male patients, studies which had only female patients, and then they have uh, give the subgroup analysis of both these groups, and the finally uh, total of both, or the combined of both these groups. And this is a very good way of exploring heterogeneity. So to summarize, each horizontal line in a forest plot represents an individual study. And the results of that individual study is plotted as a box where the size of the box represents the weight of that study. And 95% confidence interval display is displayed as a line. The implication of each study falling on one side of the line or the other side, we need to see, and it depends on the outcome. For example, if we are comparing treatment with control, or we are comparing uh, two treatment. So it will depend uh, what is, uh, where the speech of this study lies. If the individual study crosses the vertical line, then that study does not give a statistically significant difference. The diamond shows the combined result 
and the width of the diamond is the 95% confidence interval of that study. The I square statistic gives a idea of heterogeneity and it is better if the I square is less than 50% as and Dr. Goodman said, it should be even better if it is less than 40%. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Asis. Uh, we'll have the question answers in the last and I'll again invite uh, Dr. Rakesh Agrawal if he's ready with the talk. Dr. Rakesh. Yeah. He will talk on the sample size calculations. Dr. Rakesh, are you ready, Dr. Rakesh? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening. So I'm going to talk to you about sample size in a research study. Uh, apologies that I had problems earlier because of some goof up. So my uh, experience with uh, the sample size issue extends back to when I was in school. I was in class seven or eight when I had acquired a new bicycle and my mother would ask me to accompany her for grocery shopping because then I could carry the groceries back on a cycle rather than her having to uh, bring those in her hand. And we would enter into a shop and she would want to buy rice and there would be say two sacks of rice, let's call them A and B. And her question would be, are the rice in the two sacks similar in quality or is one better? What she would do would be something like this. She would pick up a handful of rice, examine them, do that for the other sack, and then come to a conclusion and tell the shopkeeper, give me A or B, depending on what she thought was better. So she was following what statisticians do or what we do. That is, we want a conclusion about a population. We want to know whether a drug would work in all patients of say hepatitis C. But what we do is we take a sample such as the, the rice in her hand, do something to them and observe on them and extrapolate the findings to a population. And the question I always was wondering about was how much rice should she pick up to look at? Whether she should pick up a pinchful, a handful, or she should pick up what one can pick with two hands. And that to me is the study size question. How much sample do we need from a sack to see? Do we need a few people? Do we need a larger number or an even larger number? So when I try to, if I ask all of you, I wish I were in a, a, a regular uh, classroom. I've done that many a time and most of the people choose the middle of the three pictures, they think that is adequate. Some people do think that the third picture where one is picking up rice with both the hands is what they would do. Almost nobody seems to agree with picking up a pinch full using three fingers. So somewhere something intuitively tells us what is an adequate sample size with most people picking the middle picture. If I had asked my mother, how big a sample do we need from each sack to compare the quality of rice in the two sacks? The answer I would get is that I should be able to form an opinion that is reasonably valid. And I did ask her and what she said was, she wanted to get a conclusion which was reasonably error free, that I should not make a mistake. What are these mistakes that we could make? And then the answer I obtained was, it is possible that I think that one of these is better. So I say A is better and I ask the short shopkeeper to give me A in preference to B. The other mistake that one could make, one could think that both of those are similar when actually one is better. Does it really matter if we make an error? And I asked her, what if you said A is better and the shopkeeper were to tell you, ma'am, you are making a mistake. Both of those are from the same stock. I just put them into two sacks separately. She said, what do I lose? Nothing. If I say this is better, that's fine. Except if the shopkeeper 
charges me more so and these are what the statisticians call as alpha error and beta error so she said it doesn't matter unless and until shopkeeper tells me that the one i'm calling better is costlier then it makes a difference for the second one again it makes a difference sometimes when you are looking for even small differences but it doesn't make a difference if you are looking for big differences now let's take this example further and i am now going to ask for your opinions and i'll at least ask you to think what you would have let us say you were comparing two sacks and we look at the picture on the left what i have called a you have two sacks in one of them 1% of grains are of poor quality in the one on the right 2% of grains here are poor quality and you are supposed to compare these two versus think of another situation when you are comparing two sacks in which 1% of rice are of poor quality or 4% are of poor quality where do you think you need to examine a larger sample where do you think you need to pick up a larger amount and examine it i'll give you 3 seconds to think most of you if we had a regular classroom would have said we need a larger sample if the situation was a when the difference between the two sacks was less marked compared to if the situation was b when the difference between two sacks was more marked let's look at another situation again there is so on the left we have a situation where there is 1% versus 2% of grains being bad on the right we have a situation where there are 5% of grains bad versus 10% of grains being bad again if you were to think i can assure you most of you come back will come back with the answer we need a larger sample size to pick up this difference than the difference shown in b even though the ratio is still 1 is to 2 because the absolute difference is more in b we would need a smaller sample size and because absolute difference is less in a we would need a larger sample size so see you heard in the previous talks that we can have characteristics which are qualitative a grain can be good or bad and that is expressed as proportions 1% of grains are bad or 5% are bad the other characteristics are continuous variables that we can measure on a scale and let's look at that uh, how would the comparison be if we were to apply that to rice so let us say we are comparing two sacks of rice one contains rice which are 8 mm in length and the other contains rice which is 5 mm in length that is comparison a and on the other hand we are trying to compare two sacks of rice where grains are 8 mm long versus 7 mm of long where do you think we need to have a larger sample from each sack again if we were physically in front of each other i can assure you you would have given me an answer we need a smaller sample in case of comparison a and we need a larger sample if we were looking at comparison b if we look at all these three examples the common thread there is greater the magnitude of difference then we need a smaller sample size if we were comparing two things whose magnitude of difference is small then we need a larger sample size okay so that is one message we we'll keep with us and let's try and get other messages let us say we are comparing two sacks of rice and in one that is situation a each grain is equal in length 8 mm and in the other sack again each grain is equal in size 6 mm now in that doesn't happen in real life i am asking you to assume that for the sake of this talk And let's say these are machine-made rice, eight millimeter in one sack, six millimeter in the other. On the other hand, you have a situation B, where you are comparing rice whose average length is eight millimeter versus six millimeter, but each rice has slight variability in length. But the mean difference is the same as in the situation on the left, that is situation A. Again, if you think about it, you are bound to come up with an answer. that we would need a much smaller sample size in situation a we would need a larger sample size for situation b so when 
different units included in a sample have variability which is larger then we need a larger sample size so that is our second message the third message how comfortable are we to make an error so we said there are two types of error alpha error or what we know as when the two groups are similar but we falsely conclude that there is a difference or a beta error when the two groups actually have a difference but we falsely conclude that there is no difference that they are similar so let us look at first the alpha error so if we choose one sack of rice as being better than the second sack of rice but in real life they are actually identical it really doesn't matter if we said a is better and i buy this it doesn't matter unless it so happens that i am told that a is costlier same way if we have two drugs and uh, let's say we have a new drug and versus we have an old drug if i get a new drug if it is no different and i think that this is better it would not make a difference unless this new drug was costlier if it was the same price even if i falsely conclude so i would be fine making more alpha error if the cost is not different or if the adverse effects are not different if the cost is going to be higher if adverse effects are going to be higher then i want to make less uh, my alpha error less the second type of error is beta error that is i think that the two types of rice are similar but there is actually a difference most of the time in life it doesn't matter but there are some special occasions when we want to put our best foot forward at that time we don't want to miss even a small difference so it depends it depends on how the situation is and this is something that is very subjective there are times uh, i'm throwing a party i'm calling a very special guest i want the very best quality rice and therefore i would make more effort and then i have to increase the sample size so if we are willing to permit some error we are okay to have a smaller sample size but if we are not comfortable with allowing much of error we can never make this error zero but if we allow a smaller error then we need a larger sample size so the three conclusions we have got from an example away from medicine is that if we want to compare two sets of observations two sets of things and we are trying to pick up a difference the sample size the amount that we need to examine depends on three things if we want to pick up a smaller difference we need a larger sample size if the units in each uh, group have very greater variability we need a larger sample size and if we are not willing to permit much of error then we need a larger sample size and this is exactly what we really need i know you've seen lots of formulae but that's what these formulae have as i illustrate a little bit later to you so when you go with your study question to a statistician these are the three questions the statistician is going to ask you he is going to ask you what is the magnitude of difference you want to pick up what is the variability within each group and how much error are you willing to permit and the answers to these are relatively easy though often we get a bit confused the easiest thing is the errors alpha error by convention we use 0.05 so we are willing to make an error of 5% now that's not fixed if the new treatment is cheaper if it is uh, going to be safer then this alpha error could be larger i am willing to say that the thing is better when it is actually not better because it does not mean extra expenditure it does not mean extra risk of adverse events beta error again we have generally keep it fixed we say it, so people talk about power how much power do does the study have to pick up a difference if one actually exists earlier most studies used to have a power of 80% now some people prefer 90% so the acceptable beta error is 0.20 or 0.10 respectively most important things are the first two how much difference between two groups is a difference that we are wish to detect so let us look at it this way if i had a if i have a disease where the mortality rate is 
how much difference do I want the new drug to make before I would start using it? If the new drug could reduce the mortality from 40% to 20%, would I use it? Of course. If I reduced it to, if it reduced it to 25%, yes, I would use it. If I reduced it to, if it reduced the mortality from 40% to 38%, would I use it? Possibly not because then I'm using a new drug about whom, which I don't know many things. I'm not bothered about a difference from 40% to 38%. 40% to 35%, many of us would say no. A few may say yes. If we said 40% to 30%, possibly majority of us would start saying yes. And that is the difference we wish to pick up 10%. So this is what the statistician is expecting from us. Variability in the measure is important only for quantitative measures. And this we can easily find out what is happening without the treatment. And if we know that the baseline that can be used. So we have heard this from Dr. Saurabh Datta in the previous sessions. So we have a hypothesis, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. We specify how much difference do we consider as relevant. This is something that we can get by thinking clinically or maybe somebody has previously said something so we can look at those historical values we define a significance level or alpha how much alpha error are we willing to permit what is the upper limit of p that we will look at we decide the beta error or power and then we can use a formula uh, so why should we calculate a sample size there are three different types of reasons the scientific reason is that if a study ends up showing a negative result if we find the two groups have no difference if there is a sufficient sample, if I've picked up a handful of rice from each sack and I cannot find a difference, I can be reasonably sure that there is no difference. But if I have only, uh, if I have only picked up uh, with my three fingers the samples and I examine and I find no difference, this is possibly because I have examined a very small sample size and even though I have not found difference, I cannot conclude that there is no difference because it is still possible that a difference exists. So for scientific reason, it's important to have a good sample size. The other reason is ethical. If you are doing a trial, if you do an undersized study, at the end of it, you do not find a difference. You still cannot conclude that the new drug does not work, but you have exposed half the people to a new drug without being of any use. An oversized study, which means you could have found with much fewer people and if one treatment was useful, you did not need to randomize more people. And that is the reason why you should not have an oversized study. And in a trial, it is important to do a sample size calculation. The same is true for funding. If you do an under science study, you've spent money, you've spent manpower, but you've not got anything useful, you cannot conclude. If you do a very large study, then you have spent extra money than what you needed to. And also because then, even with a minor difference, which is not clinically relevant, mortality has come down from 40% to 38%. It may be statistically significant, making you feel that you've got something important, whereas actually clinically that may not be relevant. So uh, today you don't really need to know formally. There are softwares available. Some are available even free. And let me show you that actually those formulae are really no, uh, basically have the same thing that I have talked to you about without formulae. Let's look at three examples, a pair t-test, an unpaired t-test, and a test for proportions. So for those of you who have looked at formulae, you would, if you were to look at a book, a book, it would tell you that for a pair t-test, you have a formula, something like this. Let's look at the three, three, uh, the three terms in this formula. If we look at something in the bottom, d square, d stands for the difference that you wish to detect. We talked about it. So if this difference you wish to detect is smaller, this being in the numerator, you need a larger sample size. And that's what we said. Smaller the difference you wish to detect, you need a larger sample size. If you have a larger variability that is shown by sigma, then you need a larger sample size. And this here are alpha and beta errors. If you allow smaller errors, you need a larger sample size. But till you know this, I think I'm fine for a clinician you don't really need to remember this formula because that would be done by software for you. So let's see that we are trying to have a drug and we are trying to see whether it reduces, changes the serum cholesterol levels of people who take this drug. We look at levels before and after. 
we need to decide beforehand how much change do we consider relevant. Let's say we think 10 milligram. That is the D. The standard deviation of cholesterol change, let's assume, is 20. That is the sigma. And we have the usual alpha and beta errors of 5% and 20%. When we put this into the formula, we get a sample size of 31. So we could treat 31 people, measure their cholesterol before and after, and we would have 80% power to detect the change of 10 milligram per deciliter. If we look at the formula for unpaired test, where we are not looking at people before and after, half the people are given the drug and half are not, and then we compare the values later, our null hypothesis is that there is no change. Alternative hypothesis is that there is a change. Again, in this formula, we see we have the same things. D in the uh, denominator, sigma, and terms for alpha and beta error in the numerator, except that we have another four here. So if we, for the same kind of a question, that whether the drug would change cholesterol by 10 milligram per deciliter, if we calculate sample size, then we find that we uh, get a sample size of 125, which is fourfold higher. So this tells us that a paired uh, design is better and unpaired design is, needs a much larger sample size. But the basic uh, things that matter remain the same. If we wish to detect a smaller difference, so not of 10, but of five, then our sample size, so this, we have reduced this by half and the sample size increases fourfold. If the variability is larger, if we change this, then the sample size increases, the things that we talked about. If we change the beta error from 20% to 10%, we want a larger power, again, the term changes and sample size increases. The thing that I'm wanting to illustrate is that if there is, if you want to pick up a smaller difference, if you change, uh, if the variability is higher, the increase in sample size is much larger as I showed in the previous slide, but to increase the power from 80% to 90%, the sample size increases, but by not as much. It only becomes about, uh, you know, by increases by about a third. Similarly, if you have proportions, again, similar things apply. So what I have tried to show you that the things that matter for sample size are how much difference are you willing to, to wish, how do you wish to detect? And that's a clinical decision. That's a clinician's decision, not a statistical decision. How much variability do you have in the groups? Sometimes you can reduce variability. If you take patients who are very similar to each other, you have a very well-defined group, then your variability would be less, and you can, again, that can help to reduce your sample size. Yes, people talk about formulae, but those are something that can be done by a software. You need to understand that we need to think of those three things that I talked about. And but those are not the only consideration. Another important consideration is what is feasible? How many patients can you enroll? It's not unreasonable for you to think of different values for each thing, try those, calculate different sample sizes and see what is feasible. You try to say that I want to detect eight millimeter change and you find you get a sample size which you cannot achieve. Then you think there is no data. Even if I could pick up a 12 millimeter difference and that's something doable by all standards, go ahead. But be upfront when writing the paper, say that we considered 12 millimeter as the difference that is important. Also think that there are dropouts and you need to adjust your sample size for that. Thank you. That brings me to the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, I'll take those. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the session and then we can have the questions and answers now. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions to Dr. Rakesh Agarwal. Akash? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll start with uh, questions to uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, here's the first question from uh, Dr. Nipun Verma. He says, uh, how, will you, how would you meta-analyze estimates from four studies which are spread over time, but from the same database. So is it going to be a different technique? Is it right? And if yes, then how do you do it? Yeah, meta-analysis underlying assumption that all in the, uh, observations are independent. So if you have four results from the same database, you can average them out, but it's gonna be a meaningless uh, 
uh, a meaningless number. I think your best bet right now is if you have the data from the same within from the same data set is just to review the results as they are, to look at the inter inter study consistency of findings. But uh, meta-analysis, I think, is developed for a different kind of situation. Maybe Dr. Kumar would disagree with that, but um, I, I think that sort of the, the design of a meta-analysis is to compare observations that are completely independent of each other. Yeah, I, I would agree with what Dr. Goodman said here. The next question is uh, by Dr. Prashant Bhangui. Uh, he asks, uh, we know that uh, that the meta-analysis and the systematic uh, review are not completely exclusive of each other, but when would you uh, prefer one over the other? Are there situations where you would do a systematic review rather than doing a meta-analysis? Yeah, there, there are multiple situations like that. I can give you a couple of examples of my, you know, that we came across. Uh, we will, you know, for instance, we did a we did a study of. Um, clinical trials of antioxidants as, as a way to prevent cancer. The large clinical trials, there's, you know, about 12 or 13 of those. When you look at, when you start slicing and dicing the data with respect to uh, um, specific cancer outcomes and specific interventions, you realize that there is really very few opportunities, if any, to, to to identify studies that really address the same hypothesis. You know, one would look at alpha tocopherol in relation to prostate cancer, the other would look at, at beta carotene in relation to lung cancer, and so on and so forth. So you have a long, long summary tables, but yet you don't have any opportunities to put the results side by side. And so that's when systematic review comes into play, but a meta-analysis is not feasible. That would be an, an example. Um, it, uh, I, I can go on, but that, that's, that's where you should stop. The other uh, possibility is that the results are so heterogeneous that averaging them out just does a disservice. Imagine if you're averaging age of two populations. One is little, little babies in the, in the nursery, and the other ones are old, old folks in the nursing home. So the, the average age of one group is one year, and the average of the other group is 80 years. You can obtain an average value for that will be 40 years, but nobody is 40 in your population. Some are one and some are 80. So might as well just abandon that idea and, uh, and report results separately. Thank you, sir. Uh, see, in the same vein, uh, Dr. Anil Agrawal has asked, if uh, on a particular topic, you find that there are more observational studies and there are hardly any RCTs or, uh, or very minimal number of RCTs, is it a good idea, good idea to conduct a meta-analysis or, or a systematic review? Yeah. Again, it all depends on, on the specific research question. If clinical trials are in a position to answer your research question and your clinical trials are in, in disagreement with observational studies, you probably will be wasting everybody's time trying to, to combine observational studies and meta-analysis when the clinical trials are override that, override that, that conclusion. Uh, again, the, there's really no single answer. It all depends on the research question. On the other hand, you may find, again, going back to examples of, uh, of uh, antioxidants and cancer, clinical trials tend to be short. Clinical trial, trials tend to um, not extend more than three or five years. If, you, if the outcome of interest is cancer, the timeline is usually 30, so you may, you know, you may make a point that relevant exposures cannot be reproduced in a clinical trial. They can only be reproduced in an observational study because you don't have 30, 40 years of follow-up in a clinical trial. Then that, that may be a good, a good reason to, to juxtapose, if you will, the clinical trial results and the, and the observational study results. If you're dealing with purely clinical question where clinical trial really answers the, uh, the uh, you know, provides a good answer, then why bother? Right, right. Thank why you. Bother I think, whether... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think you made it very, very clear. Uh, there are two questions which are uh, sort of interrelated. One is uh, if you have uh, heterogeneity in, in the trials, uh, especially in terms of the types of interventions, is it appropriate to uh, report a uniform hazard ratio 
and uh, two, if, if uh, there are inaccuracies creeping into the meta-analysis, how do you eliminate uh, uh, those inaccuracies? So uh, repeat the first question again. I'm, I'm trying to understand. So in what, case what is there that? is, uh, so in uh, cases where there is a heterogeneity in the type of uh, the population as well as the interventions done, is it appropriate to you to report a uniform hazard ratio yeah, when the control yeah. groups are different across studies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think Dr. Kubar also addressed that that uh, question in his talk. If you have high level of heterogeneity you have to ask yourself, is the pooled, is the pooled <clears throat> estimate of any value? Well, I mean, we talked about this using the example of different agents. And then what he proposed, and I think that's, that's a very good way to approach it, is to do a subgroup analysis. To try to create, create heterogeneous, homogeneous groups, non-heterogeneous groups. Then maybe you have actually two or three results that are meaningful rather than one single result that presents. Um, the other, there are other techniques, uh, things like called re meta regression, for example, where again you treat each study as individual observation, and then you do and you do a, um, a modeling of results. You know, to see how study characteristics or population characteristics may affect the results. Um, and again, this beyond the scope of today's conversation. One can spend months and months talking about meta analysis, but here is here is what I would invite you to think about a meta analysis. There are two ways to think about it, the goals of meta-analysis. One is to provide a result, and the other one to explore heterogeneity. And both can be done through meta-analysis techniques. So providing a result is, is often not feasible or not meaningful. Exploring heterogeneity is almost always feasible and almost always fe uh, feasible and meaningful. So I think it's the second goal that often provides more interesting findings than the first goal. Unless you have clinical trials that are all done the same way and the results are similar, then why do you need a meta-analysis? You, you know what the results are. Yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you, thank you very much. The last question uh, for you uh, from my side would be asked by Dr. Aruna Chanu Oinam, and she has two parts to the question. In case you don't reach the answer to the research question after the end of meta-analysis, what would be the way forward? Well, that's an easy answer if you need more studies. But, you know, my invitation always to people who write reviews and meta-analysis, instead of saying we need more studies, you want to be very specific. What kinds of studies are needed? What types of data are required? So you almost want to, com com if, if your results are inconclusive, you almost want to conclude your paper with a specific proposal for future studies. Not, not general statement, but, but almost like a, a mini proposal. So, Great. you know, prospective studies are needed. You, you want to define how that prospect, what this perspective needs to look like. If it's a clinical trial that's needed. You know, for instance, we did a meta-analysis with one of my students looking at surgery as treatment for tr drug-resistant TB. You know, these are old techniques that are, many surgeons have forgotten over the years. And now with reemergence of, of uh, drug resistant TB, they, they started dusting off the old textbooks and looking at you know, how you can treat surgically uh, TB lesions. And so you know, the results seem to, uh, all studies are observational. Very, a lot of studies are poor quality, but the conclusion is clear that probably it's time for, to fund a large international clinical trial that would test those different uh, surgical techniques in the, in the presence of severe um, drug resistance. Thank you, Seth. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goodman. Uh, yeah. This, uh, All right. Yeah, Professor Vedan Singh. Yeah, we, we have a few questions uh, directed to Dr. Rakesh Agarwal. This is one, Prajna, and uh, this uh, is regarding how do I calculate the appropriate sample size when conducting a cross-sectional study? For example, estimating the prevalence of PICO mutation of HBV in a population where no such previous studies have been done? So, uh, uh, that's an interesting question. I confined myself to comparison of two groups rather than looking at one group because of uh, limitation of time. So, uh, instead of pre-core mutation, let's look at, I'm interested in knowing the prevalence of diabetes in a particular group of people. 
you really need to think of what is the purpose of your study. Let's say, go back to our pre-core mutation. Why are you looking for it? Would you do something about it? What do you think? Do you care for these mutations if these occur in 2% of people or do you care for it if it occurs in 10% of population? And very often you would have an answer. If you are really operating in a very difficult area, you most of the times it's hardly ever that you are doing a study totally in a vacuum. For instance, uh, I can uh, give you an example. We decided that in our city, we need want to look at what is the zero prevalence of antibodies against COVID. And my colleague came and said, what level should we assume as a number on which we can calculate the sample size? And this is how I try to answer the question. I said, we know how many cases per million we have had in our city. We know how many cases per million there had been in Delhi where there has been a zero prevalence data study. So in Delhi, when zero prevalence study was done, the zero prevalence was 23%, but the number of cases had been about 450 per million. For us, the number of cases in the city have been about 300 per million. So you calculate <laughs> roughly what the prevalence would be, and that is all. So most of the time, if you look around, you can find something to compare with, and that is what you can. So the next question is uh, from Dr. Prasant. Uh, sometimes we have a situation or a study question in which at the outset, we do not have an idea of how much is the accepted or the required difference within the group to make the intervention significant. How do you progress in this type of a study to select sample size? This is especially true for studies based on surgical interventions. I think it helps to not be too focused on your area of expertise and get slightly away from your study question and you can think of an answer. So this is what happened in one of my workshops where we were discussing this subject. And we said, if there could be a drug that could be given to teenagers who are not gaining height and we could make them gain height, how much, you know, how much would you like the drug to work? And we said, if it could make you gain half a centimeter, would you be bothered? The answer was no. One centimeter, the answer was no. When we said 10 centimeters, everybody said yes. When we said five centimeters, everybody said yes. And then a person raised his hand and said, I think I have a very clear, and we said, why do you say at five centimeters, yes? And the person said, I have a very clear idea. When people are short, they are happy wearing heels, which are five centimeter in height, to show that they are taller. And I think that is something that people care for. So what I'm, my point is that if you get away from your study question and think, as a medical person, sometimes you can't think of an answer. But if you think as somebody who's not a specialist, you can think of it as an answer. Anything that causes a mortality of 40%, if it reduces to 35, would you care? With a totally new drug, possibly not. And maybe sometimes talking to some of your colleagues helps and that would give you a clarity. Thank you. Another question to Dr. Rakesh Agrawal. Is there a method of how a clinician can define clinically significant difference between the two populations? Say 8 millimeter versus 12 millimeter or a death of 40% versus 30%? So I'll give you an example. I think that seems to uh, go into a room where others are sitting and having coffee and ask a few of your colleagues, do they care for it in this in the particular condition you are dealing with? If the mortality is 40%, what would they like a new drug to be? And this could be very variable. If you are going to get a drug which is going to cost, uh, um, you know, uh, like hepatitis C drugs did initially, uh, $84,000, you want them to increase the cure rate from 40% to maybe 70%, but if the drug is very cheap, you care even if it increases it only from 40% to 55%. It could also depend on what kind of a drug you are talking about, especially the cost and the frequency of adverse events. Yeah, another question, how to calculate sample size when there are three, four groups? Are there in a study? Uh, there are tools available if you have three groups four groups but then that becomes more complex that is outside the purview of a session such as this ideally any study it is much better to have two groups that is the one where sample size would be smaller 
if you have three groups, then the sample size is going to be larger. And it will also depend on whether you want to compare A versus B, B versus C, and C versus A, or you are just looking at whether one of the groups is different from the other two. So it depends on a more, it becomes a more complex issue and you need to consult a statistician. There is another question from Dr. Monty Kajanchi. Sample size, when you are considering study where your hypothesis is one method is equal to the other, any other consideration for sample size as the effect we consider will be equal by both methods. So, uh, as the effect, so if you are trying to look at whether this one is equal to another, that happens, for instance, you have a drug which you give twice a day and you make a new preparation which is uh, fine, it, it's, let's say slow release preparation which would be once a day, then you are going to do a non-inferiority study design. The sample size calculation for that would again have a formula which can be done using or using a software that's more complex, difficult to cover in 20 minutes, and you need to go to a statistician. But the basic issues are going to be the same. Do you, what, how small a difference do you consider, do you allow for considering something as similar? If you allow a smaller difference, then you need a larger sample size. If you allow a larger difference, then you would, uh, as meaning similarity, then you would need a smaller sample. Uh, the last question looks like uh, from Aruna Chanu. Uh, sir, uh, can sample size can be guessed using the previous studies on particular disease? Yes, if you are uh, the, if you are looking at something where your alpha error and beta error are going to be similar to the previous study, which very often is. And if you have a group which is very similar to the previous study so that your variability is going to be similar, if you're interested in a similar difference being significant because most clinicians would think similarly then that should be fine provided they had done a good sample size calculation and you have access to that but as i said you could take the same assumptions which would be provided in that paper and you could do again a sample size calculation you should get the same answer so that is what i would say thank you right, Dr. Rakesh. this is uh, the end of questions to Dr. Rakesh. So, yeah, uh, there's some questions to Ashish. Can we, is it time to uh, yes. go with them or we? Okay, right. Yeah. If you have time, then this is a question from Dr. Amit Goel to Dr. Ashish Kumar. Uh, what he asks is if 95% uh, CI of all included studies crosses the line of neutrality, then shall we consider to combine them by meta analysis or not? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. If uh, that 95% confidence interval may be crossing in all of the included studies because of their sam small, smaller sample size, uh, but once we are able to combine these studies, then the combined effect would be larger and then we may show a statistically significant result. So, and but we'll have to look at the heterogeneity. If there's no heterogeneity, then it is a good idea to combine. Right. And there's one technical question by Dr. Tarun. Which software uh, is used for final meta-analysis? He's asked SPSS or Excel or something. Uh, like most commonly used knowledge. software is Revman, which is uh, released by Cochrane database. But there are other softwares also, some of them freely available, like meta-analyst software. Then there's Stata. And uh, even um, they, these uh, can be done in Excel. There's uh, small programs in Excel which can be added and we can generate process plot. But the most commonly used is the RevBen. Right, right. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I think we are done with the questions and suggestions. Uh, I think if uh, there are any comments by the course directors, Dr. Uh, Thuluvat or Dr. Rakesh, before we close. Dr. Thuluvat? Yeah, I have no comments. I enjoyed it and I think I learned uh, each time when I listen to these lectures, I learned something new. I, I hope the students, uh, young faculty will gain a lot from these sessions. 
at least they can go back and uh, listen to the recorded sessions. I learned a second what Dr. Tholuwat said. Uh, we, uh, on, on behalf of INASL, we hope that these sessions are useful to the participants and uh, we would surely love to have feedback. If you have any feedback, you could send us emails and uh, uh, these sessions are also available in a recorded form and uh, you can access those even later. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you in the next session. And Dr. Kaushal, you want to talk about the topics in the next session, please? Yeah, so next year, uh, next session, that is next week, uh, same time, we have very interesting sessions. So, uh, research, how to do research from start to finish, which will summarize possibly most of these talks. How to get the most from your mentor, you can, uh, how to do that. Balancing clinical work, research and family. I think these are very pertinent questions and all of us want to know answers for these. Uh, so I, I welcome you again to, the, to our next webinar, which would be next week, uh, the same time. And I must thank all the speakers who did a wonderful job for very crisp talks. I think all uh, kept us all in, uh, interested and the moderators who uh, generated a great discussion. I would also want to, in the end, thank the, uh, uh, the educational partners for this particular webinar, which was Sun Pharma. Uh, thank you so much and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.